In our house, we have a, I can't call it a grandfather clock because it's a, it's not a grandfather clock, but it's one of these clocks that you hang on the wall, get it wound up and the pendulum ticks and talks and ticks and talks. I want to tell you about this clock. If you live in the house with this clock, the first day or two that it's wound up, every time it dongs, bing, bong, bong, you hear it. But after a couple of days, it dings and bongs on the hour and so forth, and you don't hear it anymore unless you give special attention. You don't hear it. But that clock is serving a purpose. That's what I want to talk about with you this morning. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 1. We're going to look at it just as an overview. And we're going to see in it things that perhaps you haven't seen before. For much of my life, I read the Bible the way most people read the Bible. But a time came that I have to step back. I have to step back to see the larger picture. That's not easily done in life because there's so many distractions. There's so many things pushing and bonging and dinging and whatever that you're not, you're not really seeing what's going on here. So I want to tell you about this clock. They have one key, but they have two winding mechanisms. Now wait just a minute. Why not give me two keys? No, it's not necessary. This clock has two winding mechanisms, but one key. And at the appropriate time, I take the one key and I wind it up. And then I wind it up. And this has happened so many times and for so many years that I, I basically know what to expect. Now I can wait or we can wait in the house until one or both of these winding mechanisms run completely down. And most of the time that's the way it works. Just because there's too much else going on around you or whatever. And so you wait until what time is it? You look up there and it says 1.30 and it's 8.30. Say, I gotta wind that clock up. I gotta get back on the program. Now this clock has some strange characteristics about it. With a, a ear attuned to what's going on with a I can tell if it's running out of steam. Are you listening? On one of those mechanisms, I can tell something is running down. Why don't you stop right now and go wind it up? No, I'll get to it. But next thing you know, I'm looking at the clock and it's four or five minutes slow. And I can either wait till it runs down and then re-energize or I can say let's let's get back on the program here I can hear that clock slowing down now that's on the timing mechanism the one that makes the hands go around but then there's another mechanism and uh, my ear gets attuned to that one as well not only can I hear slowing down on this side, I can tell this one is about to go belly up. Boom. Now how do I know that? Not always, but every once in a while, the hour chime is chiming, and then all of a sudden, boing! And if it didn't stop right then and there, I know, hey, you just as well wind it up because next time, it's not going to work right on timing or on sound. So this clock is serving two functions in my life. 
in our lives and in your life. This clock is serving two functions. One is the function of knowing where we are in time. It's 12 o'clock. And the other one is phone, 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 phone. So that if I have not taken the time to look at the hands on the clock, I can still know where we are, I am, in the process of time. Now you and I need to relate what's going on with this crazy clock with the clock that you and I are part of and living in. There's a timing mechanism and there's a bong, 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 bong mechanism. And the one is to tell you this way where you are in time. If you're so busy, so caught up, so engaged, so whatever, that you're not looking at the clock. And this is exactly the language that Jesus used with the disciples about the time of the end. Fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have written. There are warnings in Scripture. And we can either look for them, listen for them, pay attention to them, or we can act like the folks down here in Florida, especially out in the Keys. Oh, we're going to leave. 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 Let's leave. But there's a solid traffic jam from the Florida Keys to the North Pole. Why do people do this? Why do people behave this way? Every year, for years, we go to the Gulf in September, usually September, sometimes October, but usually September, we go to the Gulf for a week or two of vacation. And you have to keep one ear open or one eye open for the news because it's hurricane season. And you can always tell, pardon me, the goofy folks who have come in from out of state and don't know what a hurricane is, don't know what it looks like, sounds like, what it can do. And every hour or so on the news, they're saying, the storm is headed your way. It's coming right there. Now it can turn, but the storm is coming. You, you should make plans to leave right now. And you can always tell, you can always tell the folk who really know what a hurricane can do. Oh, there's just going to be a few minutes of wind. The water is going to rise a foot or two, but it'll, it'll be over and we'll go right back to beaching it. So once this process starts, and I'm a news watcher, I'm a news hound, I can't help it. I say to my wife, we need to pack up and go home. Oh no! It's still a week away. Yes, but it's not just the storm that's not a week away. It's the traffic. It's out of gas. It's out of food. It's out of bread. It's out of water. It's out of mind. We need to pack up and go. Oh, no. Now, if we take averages three or four times, how many times will I be right and how many times will my wife be correct? It's not 50-50. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I, I, wish, I wish life worked 50-50. We'd know what our averages are. We don't know. Now, more times than not, she's going to be correct. I told you it would miss us. But what you don't want to do is play with the averages. That's what silly folk do. That's what several million people are learning right now as we speak. Oh, I've got a full tank of gas. Yes, but at five miles an hour. Um, well, the storm is still a day away. Yes, but the storm will be here in 15 hours. So I want to talk to you. You have Genesis 1 open. I'd like to ask you to look at the Bible in a way maybe you've never looked at it before. 
This rock that we're on is one of those ding-dong clocks. There was a time when it was wound up. And it's been running down ever since. That was never the purpose. That was never the plan. Well, I'm going to show you in a moment that God wound it up. And he had every purpose and every intention of keeping it wound. And we would never go through these silly motions of having to try and put the world back together again after this storm only to have the next storm hit us and the next one and the next one and the next one and we finally say, there's no use, there's no reason, there's no sense to this at all. Yes, there is. When you wind that clock up, little by little by little, second by second by second, it's going to be running down. Things are going to happen. So I'm going to ask you, before we just look at the verses here, I'm going to ask you, if we go back before the flood, in our imagination, if we go back before the flood, was the world warmer or colder than the present age? Was it warmer or was it icy at the poles? And Now how do we know that it was once warmer? We have rock fossils and all kinds of things to show us there was once warmness here where we find only ice, snow, and whatever. So earlier the world was warm. And what did that warmth do for the things that were living at that time? Were the trees larger? Was the vegetation thicker? Were the animals humongous? That was the condition of the warm condition. But something happened and the world is different after whatever happened. The world is different because there's ice and snow up there and there's ice and snow down here. You, you had to bring that about in some way, some form. Something had to happen to affect the clock, the rock. Now, if it was once warm and we have an icy condition that is unnatural to the first age, but natural for a long time in, quotes, the history of mankind that we can reconstruct, as time passes, the cold condition will begin to do what? Come on. Will it get colder? Or will it go back to where it was, the warm stage? Unless there's re-energizing of the ice and snow, it's going to warm and the conditions are going to warm. And of course the world interprets that as you're driving your car too many miles and you're whatever. No, 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 no. The world is going to attempt to bring itself back to stasis, to the natural condition. All right. This is what I'm going to ask you to see. We're going to read two verses. Then we're going to look at verse 3. And we're going to skip 4 and 5 and we're going to look at verse 6. Then we're going to skip 7 and 8 and we're going to look at verse 9. And let's see if you can understand, if you can comprehend, if you can predict by what you're seeing here, what the next process, next step is going to be. So, in the beginning, verse 1, God created the heaven and the earth. Now the earth was without form. What does that mean? And void. What does that mean? Without form and void. Let me ask you this. As, as we look with our telescopes and we look beyond and look out there, are there a lot of rocks that are without form and void? Void of what? Come on, the next few verses tell you what, what it was void of until God did something. Void of life. So silly men are down here trying to be, spend a, a, a trillion extra dollars and let's go to Mars. Maybe that'll be our salvation. 
maybe we will find a place to grow something under an umbrella there and we'll, the next generation when they're wiped out down here will be alive on Mars. We're trying to reproduce the conditions on Mars that we have here. But unless you have the same power, same energizing power, you cannot reproduce the same conditions. So the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So what does the word spirit mean to you right there? Come on. Is that a living thinking entity? The Spirit of God moved upon the waters, or is that just God said, let my spirit move? And Verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. So what was just added to the previous verses without form and void, but God is going to change things on this rock. And the first element is, and God said, and what did God say? Let there be what? Light. Tell me what light is. Visit me sometime and I'll get the key out and we'll look at this clock and I'll show you what light is. It's, it's you're adding energy to the system. Click, 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 click. God is going to do something on this rock and it's going to require energy. And God said, let there be light. So what does that mean to you, God said? Well, listen to Jesus. If you had faith as the grain of a mustard seed, you could say, and you could change mountains, and you could change rocks, and you could change. So I want you to see there's an input of energy when God did something, and God said, click, click, click. Now, verse 4 and verse 5 are giving you and me the consequences of God said in verse 3. 4 and 5 are the consequences of this energy input. Verse 6, look at verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament, an opening in the midst of the waters, let it divide the waters from the waters, and verse 7 and 8 are explaining to you and me what happens with this second input of energy. So we go into verse 3, then it takes two verses to explain what the consequences or the outcome of verse 3 is. God said. Verse 6, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament. And so, verses 7 and 8 are an explanation of the energy input. We're giving more clicks to the wind-up mechanism. Verse 9. I want you to look at it. Verse 9. I want you to see that it starts out in verse 3. And it skips to verse 6. Then it skips to verse 9. Now this is a pattern. And that's what they call scientists. Scientists are looking for patterns. They're making discoveries. Here's a discovery. God said, and then we're going to define or describe what happened as a consequence of God winding one wind. And then winding again in verse 6. Now let's look at verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place. Let the dry land appear. And it was so. This is more energy input. God said. And it is changing the circumstances of the matter or the stuff that we are part of on this rock. And God said. You have to go to the New Testament to understand the significance of what we're talking about here. Those poor human beings who were fortunate enough 
at the time 2,000 years ago to be part of the story of Jesus coming here as a human being, but as God dressed, clothed, cloaked in our humanity. And listen to their voices, these people who were caught up in humanity, and yet there is something happening here. And they would say to Jesus, Lord, if you will, you can do this. If you will, you can give me back my sight. If you will, you can heal me. Now, what is the person confessing? Come on, what are they confessing? That healing is possible, but I can't do it. But you can. So it takes three verses and three verses and three verses. Now what happens after verse 9? There's more energy input. Let's, let's go on. Verse 10, God called the dry land earth, the gathering together the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good, and God said, let the earth bring forth grass. So this is an energy input. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. Did God create the food first or the animals first? What? Come on. He made the plants and the trees and the things that produce food first. And then he made animals. It, does this sound wise? Does this sound meaningful? Does this, is, is there a picture of something? Look, from three to six to nine, the verses require basically three verses each time. There's an energy input. Click, 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 click. Once we get to verse nine, it doesn't take three verses. We, know, we go from 9 to 12. The earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed. The tree yielding fruit. The seed was in it. We're going to see that as more energy is put in, more energy is seen, more, more consequences, more results are seen. And God said, let there be light, and there was what? God said, let there be light, and there was what? And God said, let the trees and the herb yielding seed and fruit and so forth, let there be. And these things came about. So the history, the genesis of this rock that we live on is that it was without form and void. It was just a rock with millions of other rocks going around out here in space. It was just a rock. That's all it was. But there were chemical possibilities. And God decided to use this rock, the one we call Earth. Now, God is not known for changing his mind. And once he made up his mind that I'm going to use this rock and bless this rock, well, even when it was contaminated with sin, in the ages to come, is God going to choose another rock or is he going to still claim the same rock? Come on. Come on. Blessed are those that, 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 for they shall inherit what? This rock. And this rock is going to be moved out of its place according to the prophets and it's going to come to a new place in the heavens and there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. God is going to recreate life. He's going to put energy back into this rock. So let's get to the, let's get to the issue. The governor of Texas is not hindered by being in a wheelchair. He sends the word out as governor of the great state of Texas. He sends the word out to the, the news people and he says, uh, I, want to, I want to address the public. I want to address the people of Texas. So I want a, a, a news break. And they put the governor of Texas on there and he says, uh, my fellow citizens, now this is where we are and this is what is happening and this is what must happen. 
And if you live here in this certain place, you need to leave right now. Are you listening? Now, it just so happens that the people where he is describing the community or the neighborhood or the little town or the burg or whatever it is, they're sitting high and dry. And the governor must be mistaken. No, he has access to information and he knows that the water is up there, but it's going to come here. And it's only three feet deep up there, but by the time this pile of water and this pile of water and this one and this one all come together, it's going to be ten feet deep where you are. Leave now. Now wouldn't it be nice if all the people living on dry land and hearing all of this would use common sense and get out of the way. No, they don't. And finally, after appeal, after appeal, after appeal, the governor says, uh, look, my fellow citizens, this is reality. If you choose not to leave, don't dial 911 when the water rises because we're not going to answer. And don't call for a helicopter to come and lift you and your boat and your dog and your cat and your family and you and whatever out of here. Don't call. Because we're not going to answer. Is that because the governor is heartless? Come on. Come on. What, what is the governor saying? You have a will to use or not. If you choose to stay and tough it out, then tough it out because you are endangering other lives. You are asking us to come help you when we are helping you right now by advising you to get your stuff and your family and get out. Well, there's no water here right now. When the water gets here, we'll leave. Are you listening? Is this the way life is actually being played out as we gather here this morning? Exactly. Except now it's gone from Texas to Florida. And now it's the governor of Florida. And he says, uh, if you decide to stay in the Keys, if you decide not to take yourself, your family, your pets, and whatever, and leave, when the water starts rising and the wind starts blowing, don't call 911 because we're not going to answer. And don't call saying, I need gas. No, you needed gas, but it's too late. Do you understand what we're talking about? Now I want to talk to you, and I want to talk to me, and I want to talk to Seventh-day Adventists. The clock tells me the time, and the chimes tell me, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. Midnight is approaching. Pay attention. Even if I'm not looking at the clock, bing, bing, bing is warning me. One tells me where I am, and the other one says, you're out of time. This is exactly how the Bible, and exactly how the prophets, and exactly how we read, quotes the red books, and the book. We have a clock, and then we have these warnings. So on this occasion, you can find it in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. On this occasion, Jesus is with his disciples. And it says in, in uh, Matthew 24, privately, his disciples came to him privately, it says. And they had a conversation, ongoing conversation with Jesus. And it turned to... The time of the end. Listen, I didn't say the end of time. It turned to the time of the end. Do you know the difference between the end of time and the time of the end? The clock says it's the time of the end. The bong, bong, bong says it's the end. And it starts with one, and then an hour later it starts with two, and an hour later it starts with three. And it continues and it continues until 12 midnight or 12 high noon or whatever. 
This is exactly how we should be reading this book. This is exactly how we should be paying attention to this book and to this time. This is exactly what's going on. So I want to interject here and just hope and pray that uh, I'm not being misread. This is page three, it says. So for several weeks here, we've been handing you out page one, page two, page three. And page three is apparently the end of the clock. The, 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 the alarm is going to go off. So before we could even start with chart one and chart two and chart three and, and, and the one, two, and three encompass one year of time. One year of time. We did it month by month. And here we are on this third chart, this last chart in the series, October, November, December, and then January. The clock is running down. The alarms are being sounded. So before we even started the first chart, I went to the Red Books, and I went to the book. And I wanted to try and put her words with these words together in proper order, in some sequence that makes sense. Now, not everyone can do that because not everyone has read and read and read and read and read and paid attention for years and years and years and years. But before we could even do page one, chart one, I made up my mind to go out on a limb and say, I think the time has come. Now, why would I think that? People have been thinking that for thousands of years. Well, because the circumstances that are taking place in these 12 months are unlike anything that has happened before. So I want to give you one example. And I, got, I arrived at this example and this conclusion by reading The Little Lady in the Red Books. And she says, uh, in fire, what's that? Fire, flood, what's that? Flood and earthquake. With war and bloodshed, God is warning that's the dong, bong, 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 bong. God is warning the inhabitants of the earth of his near approach. doesn't say the end is here. We're talking about before the time comes, before the crisis reaches a crescendo, and we're, we're listening. Now, if there's fire, there cannot possibly be flood. Those two don't go together. That's an oxymoron. But this and other statements in the Red Books, there's going to be fires unlike anything that we have known before. So I went out on a limb and I said, there's going to be a series of forest fires. Typically, these occur in the West at a certain time of the year and we're approaching the time. But these fires are going to be historic. They're, go they're going to be beyond. They're going to, and there have been big fires in the fire season on the west coast in the western part of the country but because i was reading and reasoning i said they're going to be more fires and they're going to be hotter and they're going to increase and it's possibility that these fires will be caused by human intervention it may be that someone is just riding through the tender parts of the forest and just throwing matches out. Now you would expect, if that were the case, that they would get on TV and say, we think people are doing this on purpose. But they are hindered from saying these things in the news. Tell me why. Come on. Why are they hindered? copycat because you're going to give somebody else with an evil mind and evil intent to go and do the same. 
So let me ask you something. I, I wrote all of this. I arranged all of this before these 12 months began. How could I say we're going to come to fires unlike anything we have known? Now, that's, that's, that's a mouthful. How could we say, how could I say, how could I put that in this, this chart, that there are fires coming unlike anything we have ever seen before? Do you understand this is what is being said on the evening news, on the morning news, on the noon news? Right now, do you understand this? Maybe you're not listening to the news. My wife gives me a hard time for listening to the news. I'm not listening to the news. I'm trying to put the pieces in place on this dumb clock. Fire. We have fires. Floods. Do we have floods? What's missing? Come on. Fire, flood, earthquake. Boy, there was an alarm that went off in the last two or three days. Did you hear it? And it was at midnight. If that means anything, it was at midnight. So we have fires and floods, and in the middle of all of that, we have an 8.1 to 8.4. Is that a, is that a bong, bong? Is that, is that a, could that be a warning? Fire, flood, and earthquake with war and bloodshed. Is anybody talking war out there? So if you read Matthew 24 and verse 14, listen to Jesus, because the disciples said, uh, how can we know? How can we know? How can we know? And so Jesus enumerates fire, flood, earthquake, war, bloodshed. And then Jesus adds this. All these, quotes things, all these signs are the what? What's the next word? The beginning of what? The beginning of sorrows. So is it possible that before the sorrows would begin, God would give us the clock of 12 months? 12 months. Count the days. I'm going to be very specific, God says. I'm going to tell you. 12 months. And then the beginning of sorrows. So we ha the sorrows haven't even begun yet. I'm going to give you 12 months. That's the clock. And things are going to happen. Now I have a reason. I have my own reasons and I believe good reasons in the Bible. To keep riding this horse of doom with people who are tired of riding the horse of doom. See, Ellen White didn't write verses. She wrote pages and chapters and pages and pages and pages of, when this time comes, the church will be asleep. When this time comes, God's people will be caught up in the affairs of life and whatever and whatever and it will come as a thief. And even Jesus said, when this comes, it'll be suddenly. It'll be as though there was no warning. There are plenty of warnings. But we are so accustomed to hearing the clock, we, we don't understand where we are. We don't understand who we are. So, at the risk of uh, repetition, let's do this again. Angels can walk through this wall. I can't. I've tried, but I can't do it. I usually wind up with a smashed nose or something. Angels are not made of the same stuff you and I are made of. You and I are made of what? Come on, Genesis 1. We're made of what? Dust and dirt. Ground up rock. Add a little water and speak life. And you and I are different than the angels. How are we different than the angels? Come on. Angels have arms. We have arms. Angels have feet or whatever. 
And so how are we different than angels? Well, they are evidently able in the physics that they're made of, composed of, they are able to do things that you and I cannot do. I'll never forget Elder Hoffman describing uh, an occasion he had in which the demons were very active praying. They were praying for some person. And the demons spoke up and said, You mortals. With, You mortals. You don't understand. We have the power to make rocks boil. Now why would the demons speak up and make this announcement, this confession. Come on, because what? Because they were being challenged and they were being commanded in the name of Jesus to get out of this person, get out of this person's life. Stop. Go away. Be gone. You mortals, you don't understand. We can make rocks boil. I believe they can. I believe they do. I believe exactly what Ellen White says, that they take, they seize these opportunities where earthquakes, where volcanoes, where floods, where these things are, and they add evil energy to them. You and I are made of stuff, rock and dust, it says, ashes. We're made of stuff differently than the angels. We're energized in a different way than they are energized. I have never seen, found, or discovered, or even read of an angel cemetery. If you know of one, let me know. They live when we die. They live and live and live and live because they are energized through a different source, a different mechanism. You and I are part of a clock that can run down and run out of energy. We're different stuff. So this is the way I illustrate it. Am I this or am I this? Tell me where Charles Wheeling is. Here or here? And the answer is yes. yes. The answer is yes. Does that agree with the Bible? God formed man of the rock and dust and ash of the earth and then breathed into him the breath of life. The Bible tells us how you and I are energized as part of the fleshly creation. We can run out of energy and we do run out of energy unless God intervenes in a very special way. Now, if this 12 months means anything at all, we should be moving forward. And there are only a few months left till this clock, this 12 months runs out. Four or five months now. We should be looking forward to some great change. Some great change in earthly circumstances. And we're looking for God to intervene waiting for God to intervene, praying that God will intervene and do something. And so what follows prophetically the end of the 12 months? Come on, what follows? The latter rain. The latter rain. Is that, um, which part of the clock is that winding up? Come on, the whole clock. It's winding up the timing. It's winding up the alarms. God is going to do something and He is going to pour out His Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> answer this. What is the purpose of the latter rain? Is it going to energize people? I will pour out my Spirit on how much flesh? That's energy in that part of the mechanism. And then... When this energy is poured out, when my energy is poured out, my spirit energy is poured out on all flesh, there are going to be prophesyings. So there's going to be a consequence of this energy into the clock on this side. And there's going to be 
visions and dreams and miracles. That's the other part over here. God does not just pour out His Spirit. God is not just energizing part of this mechanism just to say, oh, I, I, I did something for them. No, 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 no. If God pours out His Spirit, is there a purpose? Tell me what the purpose of the latter rain is. Come on, this is simple, but it's not simple. It's complex. You have to read the whole book. You've got to go through the whole book to understand why at the time of the end, God is going to do what He hasn't done for 6,000 years. So, let's do it again. Here's God. Here's Jesus. Here's angels. There's heaven. Here we are, and it ain't heaven. Now, is the earth winding up or winding down? If, if you've had children or have children or spent time with the little ones, oh, they kick and they buck and they, they want to play and they want to eat and they want to all day long. And then it's time to go to bed. Then it's time to go to sleep. And what do they do? They say, good night. No. <laughs> Tell me what... They do. Real life. Tell me what they do. They get wound up. Oh, and then all of a sudden. Yes or no? You're talking about people. You're talking about life on this rock. You're talking about this rock. There's going to be a winding up to wind down. And you and I happen to be born at such a time as this. You and I happen to be part of this timing on the clock, on the rock. You can say, well, uh, I, I, I think I'd, I'd rather be a, born at a better time. That ain't the way it works. Well, I would like to wait until it's all over and then I would like to come out of hiding. That's not the way it works. Who knows, but you and I are come to the kingdom for what? Such a time as this. So I'm going to put this together in a speedy conclusion. I have asked Elmira and Tim and Tony and the folk here in the office, help me send these out, several thousand. Let me send them out. Now, am I risking my reputation by doing this? Yes or no? Do I care about my reputation? The answer is no. If I cared about my reputation, I wouldn't have been doing this for 36 to 40 years. My reputation ain't nothing. But if it turns out that the things that are foretold and seem to be predicted in the red books and in the book and in the 12 months, if it turns out that this is correct or more correct than not, then what about the people who are in harm's way? And we're, we're not talking about the folk in Texas and we're not talking about the folk in Florida and we're not talking about the folk where we're talking about church members. We're talking about the people who have been warned and told and warned and told and warned and told. Is there a danger in warning and telling and warning and telling and warning and telling? Yes or no? Right. Yes. Yes, there is. And someone has to say something. And so this is my statement. God cannot allow the time of the end. I didn't say the end of time. I said the time of the end. God cannot allow the time of the end to just come as this great grand surprise to His people. God has to tell us before the storm gets here with enough time ahead of time so that we don't get on the freeways and sit there. So that we don't run out of gas and sit here. So that we don't, so that we don't, so that we don't, so that we don't. 
Now, looking back and looking ahead, would you say that Seventh-day Adventists, by and large, are more awake or more asleep? Come on, we're not passing judgment. We're not saying they're lost if they're this and lost if they're that. That's not what we're talking about. Would you say that as a people, are we more awake or more asleep? Come on, the answer is... Volume 5 of the Testimonies is an unusual volume of the nine volumes of Testimonies. Volume 5 is that part of the Testimonies in which uh, Ellen White has described in considerable detail the condition of the church when the time comes. You listening? So if you would like to find out for yourself what the circumstances within and without the church are going to be, I would challenge you to get volume 5, and if you don't have it, I'll loan you one. And you will find that she says uh, God would have his people do this, and God would have his people do this, and God would have his people do this. And you get to a certain part, a certain part in the volume 5, and she says... Uh, now, if you don't, don't dial 911 because he ain't going to answer. Dear Father in heaven, we're just flesh, we're just flesh, we're just flesh. And we live down here and time just drags on and on and circumstances and bad news and a little bit of good news here and there sprinkled in and Lord just just we're flesh just have mercy on us and forgive our humanity our flesh but if we are the people and if we were told ahead of time and if we were warned and if we were warned to be ready before the time and at the time and in the time and I pray that you will bless us, each one of us. We're just a handful, a little few people. And what can we do? What can we say? What can we change about the flow of time and humanity? Evidently, there is something we can do. Evidently. Because time after time, page after page, chapter after chapter, we are told the work that the church might have done in times of ease and prosperity, she will be forced to do under the most forbidding and difficult circumstances. Please help us not to get caught in the traffic jam. Please help us to do what we can do in our flesh with the help and aid of your spirit. Help us to exercise faith. Help us to understand that one book can change thousands of lives. Thank you for blessing each of us and our families. Thank you for blessing this little ministry and this little community. Thank you for the outcome and the outreach that we have, not only in miles, but in thousands, yea, millions of hearts and minds. Bless our efforts, multiply them for good, and help us to wake up and understand who we are and where we are. And what is your will for each one of us in this time? I thank you and ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.